Well, I believe we're li we are live, everybody. However, uh, the picture is not there. It is. There's the picture. Welcome, everyone. We're Hi. back from a little bit of a hiatus. And you. This is from um, one of my lesser-known favorite Tom Hanks movies. That thing you do. <laughs> I can't do the dancing like Ms. Felicity can. <laughs> you can do the gums. <laughs> gums. <laughs> that is from thing That Thing You, you do. do. I don't even know the song and I knew that was going to be the worst. It's a cute, fun little movie. He um, looks about 12 in it. Tom Hanks? Yeah. Well. 1996. There you go. He was about 12 in 1996. <laughs> But well, welcome everyone, our little musical intro as we wait for some folks to join us. Lily Mercer has joined. Hello, Lily Mercer. Hi, Lily, in your new place, in your new home. Yeah, welcome to Richmond. Well, that's where Lily lives. I We're know. not in Richmond. I'm, just, I'm okay, welcoming her to Richmond. and we're, oh. we, I just lost a guest. She got up and she's leaving. Forget it. It's over. <laughs> I have to do this by myself. Um, oh, wait a minute. There, she's back now. Okay. Good. Welcome everybody listening to the podcast. Uh, my name is Max Tim. My name is Felicity Wren. We're with the International Screenwriters Association as well as Creative Screenwriter Productions and my consulting company Story Farm and Ooh. Felicity's theater uh, The Hen Chickens. And <laughs> we do a lot so. of different things. Um, but yeah, I hope everybody's good. Everybody's having a good summer. If you are on the other side of the planet, um, hopefully you're staying warm. I know we have a lot of Australian watchers and listeners. Um, and... Uh, Oh, actually, on that little note, one of my writers through the Story Farm said, hey, are you having Alex Ferrari as a guest to our Third Thursdays event tomorrow night in Los Angeles? And I said, yes. And she said, I am such a huge fan of his. Ah. So I'm going to have to tell Alex that uh, he has some Australian He has a fan across fans. the pond. Yeah. And not Way in the UK across pond. the pond. <laughs> the other pond. Yeah. The bigger pond. The very far away pond. <sighs> Welcome, Mary Davis. Mary Davis is in. Hi, Mary. Daniel Gonzalez. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, we have a fun topic tonight. Uh, character, what did I title it? <laughs> characters we love and why. <laughs> I knew it was about characters. Um, as always, I have a few ca you know, little announcements that we want to make, but our summer has been an interesting one so far, right? I've, uh, you are going to be going to Paris shortly. Yes, next Wednesday. I go, so I'm going to be away for three weeks from next Wednesday. I'm going to Paris, Milan, Florence, London, Edinburgh. Man, quite the trip. Um, she will likely not be doing much work during that time, so I'm going to have to pick up the slack. Such a load of crap. <laughs> that's why I said it. Um, no, One it's second, more, everyone. That's more coming from just jealousy of, of being able to traipse around Europe with a best friend and have fun. Look at that. She's watching it on the Facebook. and look I'm at going her, to look live. Guns. Going to the guns. You're going to hear live. it if it goes live. You know. I'm going to put it on silent. Oh, okay. It's oh. all right. I've, I know I'm not massively great at technology, but I can manage to put silent on my computer. Yeah, and there, everybody can see my little shirt. This is my ode to one of my favorite little movie characters, Wilson. From... From uh, Castaway. It just looked like you were playing with your nipples there. It's yeah, like you were I, like, <laughs> my favorite guy. Oh, one second, everyone. Yeah, let me, because oh. that feels so good and everybody wants to see that. Feels so <laughs> I was flipping the shirt out for everyone on the podcast so they could see it. Felicity had other things in mind. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, we were talking about summer plans. We're uh, more than halfway through. It's July 17, 2019. I, I was in Wisconsin for two weeks, enjoying the quiet of the countryside with my friends and family. I saw the Dave Matthews Band. That was nice. <laughs> it was a blast from the past. Uh, and it was fun. It was very rainy and humid and, and, you know. Mosquitoes. But my road trip was, was a good one. I do a road trip basically every year. And it went by a lot faster. If everybody is looking for a podcast to listen to, and I, I want Felicity to start listening to, uh, Dax Shepard, who is married to Kristen Bell, they're both actors. I'm sure you've seen both list. of them, Kristen, yeah. She's on my list. Veronica Mars? No, uh, The Good Place. <laughs> okay, Good Place, yeah. Um, we've made a list of our favorite characters in movies and TV. We'll go through those. But anyway, Dax Shepard has a podcast called Armchair Expert. I listened to probably 15 of them on the drive, and every single one of them is excellent. Um, he has millions of fans already, and he's just a really great interviewer, and he interviews some really top-notch A-list people, but they get really vulnerable, and they talk about... Well, he's about, been through so much, hasn't he? Yeah, you know, he's, he's a recovering he's alcoholic. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So it's it's a good podcast. Anyway, that was not that was improvised. We yeah, that we're not. He's not supporting our Wine Wednesday yeah, today. Right. Let's talk about who is. I wish he was our sponsor. No, Steel so, Wines is one of our sponsors. Speaking of, I forgot. I was so excited to drink wine, and we need to be pouring this. And I'm just going to show you it. It is the Lake County 2015 Malbec from Red Hills Lake yes. County. Looks really gorgeous. How about that the looks ladies like a very this time? a very big bottle. Look at the size of that sausage. <laughs> Jeez. If everybody listening on the podcast was uh, not paying attention or just tuned in, uh, it's not that kind of podcast. No. And look how much more she's giving herself. Have I? <laughs> no. <laughs> See? It's equal. no contest. It's equal. I mean, Look at it. There's no it's balanced out. It's, it's completely it's the same. Oh my god. And then she's trying to stop me from pouring more. Honestly, there is nothing in that. Can you see that, everyone? There you go. You can have your giant glass of wine, and I'll have my little oh, sip. Oh, dear. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be down your gullet in We're two right seconds. back at it. It's been at least, what, three weeks? I think three or four weeks. It's been like a month. I know, but this doesn't stop when we're not doing Wine Wednesdays. This continues in our day to day living. Because Even when we I was are in Wisconsin, roommates. we Skyped together, and I was giving her crap about, I don't know, something. Something other. Things. But anyway. He skipped showing me around his garden office. <laughs> blah, 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 yeah, blah, blah, right. blah. yeah, it was hot as heck out there. But anyway, um, yeah, Steel so Wines, thank wines, you to Steel Wines. We love you, Steel Wines. Cheers. You're amazing. Cheers. Thank you for Cheers. all your support you do for our third Thursdays and for our Wine Wednesdays. Um, Ooh, we will wow. get to, God, it's powerful. Yeah. We will get back to third Thursdays in a second, but mm-hmm. the next person will say a massive, 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 massive thank you. And we are so honored that he is our sponsor, is John Truby. John Truby is a consultant. Uh, if you haven't heard his name, then you haven't been paying attention. I don't mean that as an insult. But John uh, has been in the consulting game for as long as just about anybody. I think Michael Haig might have a few years on him. <laughs> I think he's worked on over a thousand scripts. He's worked on so many projects with so many writers from A-list down to brand new um, he's one of the best. He's he's one of the famous. He's kind of up there with Robert McKee, Michael Haig. Um, he's great. Yeah, he's one of the consultants that everyone knows their name. He has a specific yeah. um, set of rules that he likes to use, and he's actually offering a webinar for free. So As you can, you can sign see up. on our logo on the screen, obviously people listening on the podcast can't see it, but he is doing a free webinar Wednesday, July 31st, uh, at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Yes, 12 p.m. Pacific time. You just have to log on to, um, we have a new social media director. Uh, Samantha. The lovely Samantha. And she will be giving you the link. So you can basically just go straight from that link, claim your spot now, and it's a free webinar where you will learn. There's a whole list of five little elements. Yeah, and you know, just for the fun of it, we'll read through some of it. Um, we're not going to be giving anything away, obviously, here in terms of the, the webinar, but it's free. You should jump in there. You could just go to trubywriterstudio.com, and you can find it that way, or Samantha's going to be able to share it in the comment section here. Free webinar from one of the best. Um, you're going to learn in this webinar. I'll read some of this. Why adequate conflict is one of the keys to great narrative drive, how narrative drive changes based on your genre, which characters promote narrative drive and which don't, knowing this, you can't focus on, I'm not going to read that part, <laughs> which characters promote narrative drive and which don't, why story world is the biggest enemy of narrative drive, and yet a vital component to your voice, and then knowing how to make them work together for maximum, maximum impact, and then how to create plot that increases narrative drive in every story medium. So obviously there's... The focus is narrative drive. Narrative drive. <laughs> there's a focus on that term, narrative drive. We are not going to tell you what narrative drive is because that is a John Truby term. That's what he's going to be teaching in that webinar. However, it will make your storytelling a hundred million times better. You're going to learn a ton. Um, our interpretation of it in a very minor way is... And in a way so that we can make it fun for you to watch this while yeah, you're right. listen to a podcast. <laughs> it gave us a little bit of a topic. Um, is character. Now, there's a lot more to narrative drive, just from what I, I know from John Truby, than just character. But um, it was a way for us to kind of segue into that a, a, a subject and topic. And so we're going to talk about not only what our favorite TV and movie characters are, just for the fun of it. And you guys can all share yes, your favorite. Yes, please join in. We like to hear what your favorite please TV share. and movie characters are, too. Because it's so much more fun when we play together. So, And we like playing with you. 
Yeah, and Mary Davis says, took his writing uh, workshop many years ago. I credit his teaching with being what helped turn my screenwriting into winning. There you go, Mary. Mary is not paid by John Truby. <laughs> no, or by the ISA. Yeah, right. <laughs> And um, she's, a very, she's a very vital member of our Third Thursdays crew, too. Yeah. We have a few other announcements. Well, we so to... I wanted to say, not only are we going to list the characters, but we're also going to talk about what makes great makes for great characters, yes. as opposed to just and a fun list. We hope that great characters will then plug into the narrative drive explana explanation. Right. So um, if you are going to sign up for the free webinar, then if you've already thought about the characters you like and why you like them, I think it will probably put you in good stead for yeah. listening to the webinar. Yeah, so Wednesday, July 31st at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks again to John Truby and his team for yes, sponsoring. Yes, thank you so much, John yeah. Truby. All right, and so team. we have, and who, I'm sorry? And team. We have a few and other team. announcements, yeah. yeah. Um, we have some deadlines coming up for our contests. Contests. As usual, you should all be submitting to contests. Just because it builds your writer's resume, and that is Fast Track. The final deadline is August 15th. Um, we have, uh, it'll be eight people, um, eight mentors. We have mentors already Penny. lined up, yeah. Um, really, I think they're the best we've ever had. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I've not looked at the list yet, so I don't know. Yeah, I can't announce them as yet. They're kind of being announced gradually, but honestly, I think they're the best we've ever had. Um, it's going to really help whoever comes to LA or who lives here and then gets to meet them. So we're really excited about that. And then the table read my screenplay Austin final is August 8th and the reason why I think you should enter that one is, with a script that is good for a table read but please bear that in mind is that the we are actually partnering with the Austin Film Festival for this event so you'll be getting a weekend pass to the actual screenwriters part of the yeah, Austin Film Festival which is a big deal and you'll be treated as if you're an Austin Film Festival winner so you can go to the parties they're going to you can go to the it's panels they'll be going to nothing better than being to. treated like a winner but the thing is as well, that they're, because we're doing the event together, Austin Film Festival are going to basically treat our table read winner as one of their own. And that Beautiful. is amazing. Yeah. And I cannot wait for the person that wins that. Yeah. It's going to be so wonderful. Felicity yeah. did say something, what makes for a great table read screenplay? What is it? Uh, not too many characters. Um, not not too much masses of no, yeah, narration. Um, so big sci-fi epic or an old like Western drama or something. It's harder. It's difficult. You, as I mean, good as is, it is. It depends actually. If it's the most amazing script, we'll try and make right. it work. Right, we're going to award it. Yeah. But things that are very character driven, oh, funnily enough, mm -hmm. and uh, that are um, full of life, energy, fizz, bubbles, excitement. I would say dialogue driven. Yeah, dialogue. It's just more fun to watch and participate in table read that's dialogue driven. Yeah. And then instead, you have to have someone like Felicity, you know, reading for an hour or more, <laughs> and you hear just the narrator as opposed to the actual. Well, player. I was told that she was pretty good at it. Felicity's very good at it. But yeah, it, that isn't the point. It's not come. You haven't come to listen to me narrate. You've actually come to, and actually, I'm not doing it anyway. Molly's doing it. Um, so you've actually coming to watch the actors perform. So it's professional actors will do that for you mm -hmm. and uh, with a director from Austin. Yeah. He'll be working with you. So it'll be so much fun. I love table the Table read, myscreenplay.com. You can go there. Then you're going to be away while I'm away too, while I'm in I am Gay going, Paris. yeah, so the house uh, will be alone and the, with the cats. But... Um, no, we have someone coming to I stay know, here. I know, so, so I <laughs> We're not leaving them with a bowl of food. I don't think they were too concerned about us abusing any animals. I would, the cats will be taken care of. Um, but while Felicity is, <laughs> I was going to tease her again. While Felicity's in Paris, I'm going to be in Portland at the Willamette Writers Conference two days, uh, teaching a workshop on Thursday at the end of the month, and then uh, August 1st, that Friday, another workshop. Um, so anybody in Portland, anybody who's teach? interested. So the uh, Thursday workshop is going to be how to adapt your uh, book into a film. Really short, quick like 45 50 minute workshop so i'm gonna have to jam a bunch of stuff in there the next day on friday is going to be a little bit more all-encompassing talking about the craft from a character meeting structure standpoint that's kind of my my go-to um and that's what i work with all of my writers on you know in terms of story farm and stuff so cool that, that'll be about an hour and a half so but you're from i'm portland. looking forward to going to portland i've never been to portland my sister's been living there for i think three or four years <laughs> i haven't visited her yet so i'll get a chance to see my sister's family which will be good too 
And if you were interested in Table Read My Screenplay, we actually have our Hollywood one coming up. And if you're LA based, you can actually attend. So we have a link for you to come along and sign up for it. It's on August the 3rd, and you'll actually hear excerpts from, or you'll hear the full grand prize winning script, because it's a pilot, so it's only 33 pages. Yeah, right. And then you'll hear an excerpt of the feature, which was the Hollywood ISA Writer Award, um, Mission College. So it's Lady Parts is the grand prize winner, and Mission Got College it. is the feature, ISA Writer's Award for Hollywood. And that's so, in Hollywood, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's in Hollywood. It's at the Lowe's Hotel, so it's right in the centre of Hollywood. And that should be a lot of fun, actually. You get to hang with everyone. There'll be a lot of the ISA team there. I won't be there. I'll be in Edinburgh at that point. But, um, oh, well, well. but at the uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, I'm going, to see some, I'm going to see some people do their stuff, you know. I am, it's kind of a busman's holiday in the fact that I am still <laughs> working, you know. <clears throat> All right, well, anyway, those are our announcements. Um, let's say a hi to a few people. So we've got EJ. EJ Wyatt's here. Um, Hello, Shana. Nice Shana to see you. Band. Hello, Katie. Katie Tim, my mom, just joined us. My dad is probably looking over her shoulder watching. Hello, They're, Karma. They are likely uh, down in, in their basement watching some form of a TV show, or, or my dad's watching something and my mom is annoyed that <laughs> he's watching something with like cheetahs and nature shows or something. I'm just giving my parents a little help. Does he always hang on to the... He's usually the remote control dude, yeah. Yeah. Single right. ladies. Actually, in this house, <laughs> we are very lucky in the fact that we have two TVs. So Max can go and watch baseball in the back there. Yeah, I got and, uh, and I watch Fraser reruns in and the front. And she watch Agatha Christie and Miss Marple or whatever. Oh, yeah, and I do... Ah, God, that's another couple of people I didn't write on my thing. <laughs> It's a good segue, because yeah. in terms of characters, and we do want to know who your favorite characters are. David Potter, good to see you. Uh, Priya Gopal, hello from Holland. Good to see that. Hi. Isn't it late there in Holland? Um, it is, what time is it here? 7.15 in Los Angeles, uh, Pacific Standard. Anyway, uh, I'm going off on tangents, but hello to everybody uh, joining us here. So what are we going to do? We're going to talk about characters, and uh, first let's kind of talk about what makes for a great character, just in general. I mean, I didn't say I'm going to ask you this, but what do you think makes for great a great character? Great hair. Great hair. Okay. All right. That's That's it. our show. That's all we got for you. No, I mean, obviously it's someone who's compelling, okay. undeniable. I'm liking this word recently. I feel like a script has to be undeniable, a character has to be undeniable. So what does that mean, though? Undeniable is in the fact that whether you are, you are drawn to them in such a way that you cannot look away. So whether even if they're a terrible person, Walter White, even if who has who had a good beginning but was you know, overtaken that. by ego, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that you are so intrigued by who they are and why they are the way they are. Okay. That they're undeniable. So unique is huge. Unique. Unique is very important. Um, unique New York. New York's unique. <laughs> is that an acting technique? Yes, yeah, an acting tongue twister. Unique New York. New York unique. I got no, you had to do the S. Unique New York. New York's unique. Oh, with the apostrophe. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> unique New York. New York's unique. Got it. Ah, Bam. I gig whip, gig whip, totally gig whip, be an actor. Whip. It's so easy. Mm. Um, all right, so what else makes her a great character other than being unique and compelling? Being in a great situation. Being in a great situation. Okay, so yes, you want to put a unique character into a great situation. Does the situation make the character? Well, sometimes. I think things you go through can change your perspective right. and make you a better person or a worse person. A good example, I always go back to this, you, peop uh, you people. Everybody's you people! <laughs> you people! You people! You people are probably tired of hearing this, but 40-year-old virgin... You have a 40-year-old virgin put into a situation Stop going on about being, that. No one minds, Max. I'm, oh, my God. <laughs> Good to know. I'm glad no one minds. I'll own it. Rolling eyes, everybody on podcast. <laughs> Thank you for interrupting the educational portion of this yeah. podcast. Anyway, 40-year-old um, virgin put into a situation of being forced to go on as many dates as possible. You just have a built-in level of not only conflict, but the conflict that then drives the, the funny, the comedy. Yeah. You know? Drives the funny comedy. So the situation in that, in that sense, I don't think it makes the character. What it does is draws out the flaws within that character. Draws out the flaws. Draws out the flaws within the character. Um, okay, so that's good. Relatability, I have a whole list of things here. Yeah, so, no, actually, that's what Mary said. Mary said unique but universal. I like that. Unique but universal. Two U's back to back. Um, unique but universal. 
Yeah, well, that's the way we got a whole bunch of comments here. I didn't think Brad Pitt was a good actor until he played the character he did in the movie Snatch. There you go. I think a lot of people felt that, that way. Um, so thank you, James, for say, uh, saying I really dig your show. Unique but universal. So universal is another word for relatable. I will argue, though, that a character doesn't necessarily need to be relatable. Aspects of the character could be relatable. One of the, my favorite characters that I put down is the bride from Kill Bill. I love Uma Thurman's character in that movie. I cannot relate at all to her other than from this level of wanting to at least enact revenge in some way. To get her... Who do you want to get? To get her level of, you know, make sure that her enemies get comeuppance. We all have a little minor level of that. The people we don't like, we hope. I have a big secretly. justice thing. It's Yeah, justice. I like justice. It's totally about justice. So there is relatability even in The Bride from Kill Bill, uh, even though I can't relate to Is it not just that she looks really hot in that outfit? She looks great in the outfit. And she's a badass and she can kick everybody's butt. Yeah. Relatable. And she's standing up for herself. So there, there are ways to make characters relatable even if they're unlikable. Um, on the flip side then, if you are creating a character that isn't very relatable, let's say, there may be a couple little minor aspects, you at least need to have some form of understanding or empathy, kind of like Hans Gruber in Die Hard. I don't relate to Hans Gruber, I didn't like him, he's a horrible person, but we understand what he's trying to do. And why? Even though we don't necessarily agree. Is that Alan Rickman's character? Alan character. Rickman's character. I just liked him, he's such a good actor, isn't he's he? He always great. brings such compassion. He's he a was. great villain. And you know what he Rest wants. In peace. And so, so un, he, what, you want to have a level of understanding and empathy. What else? I mean, I'm. I, I don't you wrote your list out, and now okay. you're asking me off the top of my well, head. Well, what else might there be? <laughs> He's got a cheat sheet. He's yeah, going to what? be say something. Um, a problem that poses a major obstacle Jesus. for him or her. So that was her reading from the cell phone in front of me that I apparently wrote. A problem that poses a major obstacle. So that's kind of like what you were saying. A, create a situation for this unique character that you've already created. That you, situation should naturally be filled with obstacles and problems. Um, <clears throat> and well-rounded and we complex. Got? I think with, why don't we talk about some of these people rather and then actually put these in context? Because I feel like otherwise we're just doing okay. a list of this. Okay. These. I was trying to give a little bit of a roundabout way of. of but we can into still a, talk about that. Okay. But with our characters in, in mind. Maybe we should pause this and plan the show a little bit more. And then we'll come back to everybody. And we'll <laughs> Can you tell we haven't been here for three weeks? <laughs> However, we have got a very tiny pool in the garden. She did get by a pool. It's by seven by eight. Seven <laughs> by five. Seven by five, right. And it's basically just like a little wading pool. But it's great because it's been so hot. So sit in there to it that. So yeah. basically we've spent our time in that so we had, rather than arguing. So we're just coming back to argue here for you. Um, <laughs> so, okay, I mean, I was trying to write. So we were trying to write a list of characters. Now, are you ranking these? I didn't rank them. Okay, good. I didn't either. Um, but I hard. think it would be really great for you to, uh, anyone that's watching, to have a little bit of a think about your favorite characters are and why. Please share them, yeah. I like... Detective stories. Now, I really enjoy, um, like, Hercule Poirot or Jessica Fletcher. What was the first one? Hercule Poirot. I have no idea who that is. Uh, it's, an, it's a kind of Belgian detective. It's this thing I was just watching before we oh, came on. It's, okay. like a, it's, a, it's Agatha Christie, but written okay. it's one of his, her main characters. Oh, like P I see. P I E R O T. Pierrot. Got it. Yeah, I remember. I recognize the last name. I didn't know. Okay. Hercule. Got it. It's from Belgium. Okay. Um, and then Jessica Fletcher, and then there's Miss ah, Fiony So that Fisher. was Jessica Fletcher from, everybody under, I hope you know the name. It's um, Murder, She Wrote. Murder, She Wrote. So that was the name I put down. I'm like, I wonder if Felicity's going to remember that this is one of her favorites. I love Jessica yeah. Fletcher. Okay. Well, that's why I put I that mean, down. So I guess what I really like is I like the character that um, is a busybody, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all of them are busybodies. Um, but they're kind of like, they tend to, I love looking into their lives where they're busy doing something. They're like, Jessica's an amazing author. And then she kind of always is somewhere and then something crazy kind of happens. There's always some kind of death follows her around. Hercule yeah. Poirot is the most incredible detective. And the, but then the one we were just watching, he has just retired. And the, but still, a friend calls him to see him and now he gets embroiled in a murder case. And then finally Fisher, which is this Miss Fisher's... Um, 
watched this, an Australian TV show. And she, it, she's set in the 1920s. Finding Fisher. Oh, that's Finding the one with the, girl, the woman who's always really dressed well. Yeah. And, yeah. It's the 1920s. She's a flapper. Yeah. She's a single woman. She, she is tamed by no man. And she uh, has a little, a little gold gun with a pearl handle, and uh, she's always shagging everybody. I mean, like literally, if there's a if there's a hot bloke in the in the cast, at some point you'll see him with his shirt off. So to see it that way round is so wonderful. Fishes, oh, I have to look at it. Is, but anyway, um, and so and she's just. I think she obviously has money, and she's, but she's always helping everyone. She takes him like. Um, lost little people under her wing. Right. So I guess what I think is what I'm saying is I like these characters that have these busy lives, but then who still have time for others and are coming to help and investigate and okay. put pieces of the puzzle together. And like all of the characters you're describing <clears throat> are extremely talented at what they do, like to the point of being almost like superhero level of being so good at it. Yeah, I'm awesome. So they're incredibly s smart. But at the same time, they're not abusing that ability. They're using it for good. Yes, and, and, and it's always like a surprise that they're there, or you know, they're very well respected by the people around them. Right. Yeah. But they kind of find themselves getting involved almost by accident. Right. Which is interesting because I didn't put Sherlock Holmes on my. Uh, oh, he is on mine. Okay, so I didn't put him on Benedict my list. Cumberbatch. I don't know if I would, mainly because Sherlock is not like those women. He's extremely selfish. He's so flawed to the point of being unlikable, but he's so good at what he does, and he's so smart and witty, and he's such a know-it-all, you can't help but love watching that character. So I think Sherlock Holmes is actually a really good example of someone that you really can't relate to. He's not very Oh, he's a drug nice. addict. Yeah, he's not a he's not Plays a violin, who likes a them? Person. Um, he's not evil, of course, but he's just not that likable, but he's so good at what he does. And a lot of superheroes have that. Oh, level. I think he has a little kink, so especially the um, um, Benedict Cumberbatch one with Martin Freeman oh playing Doctor Watson, Best. because I think that there is a tenderness between the two of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, they're and friends, there's, and and you can start to see the softness in him. You know, being it feels like almost being a genius is too hard for him mm -hmm. to live in a normal way. That I think was one of the best parts of that show, and if you haven't seen the Sherlock on BBC, yeah, BBC America, I think it's so it. good. Um, I think they're like hour and 20, hour and 30 minute episodes. Yeah, they're like so. movies. Yeah. But that, I think, is what really sells the show for me is Martin Freeman already knowing that this is his best friend. Like, he's completely committed. And yet, Sherlock slowly comes to and just little by little admits, fine, I like you, kind of. It's that relationship that ultimately, I think, drives the rest of the, the show. All the plot-oriented stuff and solving the murder, that's just the fun of it. But yeah. the character relationship. That's the reason for them to be together. Yeah. And also Moriarty, the actor that plays Moriarty is one of the best oh God, actors I have so ever good. seen. He's so good. Andrew, I think his name is Andrew something. Um, yeah, I can picture him. I can't. Hi, Anthony McBride. Hi, EJ. Some comedies are solely based off character development, half baked Seinfeld. Mmm, interesting. Yes. There we go. Mary Davis, the fun of having Acorn TV and Britbox sees. Sees the shows. Mm, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, Felicity about, I do constantly watch watches TV. Acorn TV. We've seen Agatha Raisin. That's another really good one. My friend actually produced that from the UK, and it is <laughs> marvelous. It's it's so camp and delightful and funny and ridiculous. Um, and I think you know there was a time when trying to find good female characters either in movies um, or in TV was much harder than it is now. And so, but what I did instead when I realized I was making my list is that I have an awful lot of white folk on my list. Well, and when I was making my list, I was looking up for just kind of reminders to make sure I don't forget anybody. So I was Googling, you know, favorite movie characters of all time. There were so few women on that list. Yeah. It was a little striking, like obviously striking. Yeah. And so women were the minority. Sad. And now women and of course just people, people of color. Of color yeah. It was just like, okay, well. So, I mean, like, I'm, what I'm saying is that, you know, TV seems to have moved a bit more towards there being some great female characters. Yeah. I could actually list, I have actually a longer list of women than I do men for my TV. Yeah. But um, people of color, very, it's, there were not that many um, TV shows to choose from. Yeah. Well, and and I, I hadn't seen a lot of them. And it, would, it, it, I don't know if it made me sad, but it did make me just kind of check myself a little bit because, you know, I had that thought of, 
I'm sure Felicity probably has a lot more females on her list. I have more men. It's just because that's who I'm identifying with and trying to relate to. Same for females. But I realized that if I was a black man or a, you know, a black boy being raised in these movies, and it had to have, I mean, this is an understatement, but it had to have been strange not seeing someone that they can connect with visually up there. And I'm so glad that those things are slowly changing. Yeah, it is slow, but it is changing. I connected with all those characters, those those grown men. Like Indiana Jones is on my list. He's one of my favorites. Um, I wanted to be. Why Indiana do you like Jones. him? Oh my God, he's 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 confident about not really knowing everything. Like one of my favorite lines is in I think it's uh, uh, the first one. Um, Indiana Jones. The, uh, and the Raiders, Raiders, Raiders of the Lost, Lost Ark. Lost Ark. And the 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 ark gets stolen by the Nazis and he is you know up against this sand dune or whatever and he tells they ask him Indiana gives this level of here's what we're gonna do a plan and his friend says uh, something like are you sure it's gonna work out Indiana says I don't know I'm making this up as I go it's just this window into who the character is he's not he's confident but he's he's only really just confident in his physical abilities right the rest of it's like I don't know <laughs> and he's just gonna do it. So there's that level of bravery of I'm going to do it. He's got courage, anyway. yeah. He is doing it solely, doing it meaning trying to get the ark or whatever the artifact is, solely because of the famous line of "This belongs in the museum." That's that was totally defined. So he's willing to step off the cliff. Yeah. In order to do what he thinks is right. High ideals, yeah. Right. Extremely high ideals, and for heroes, uh, regardless of good or bad, they need to have some form of high ideal uh, that they believe in. And so if you are trying to write some form of a hero character, even if they're a down and out like Will Smith's character in... Um, Happiness. Uh, no, Hancock. Right. Um, which is really, I didn't put him on my list, but it's a really great character. And it was a little play on the superhero hero in that he was down and out, he was a drunk, and he wasn't being a superhero anymore. And so he comes out of you know retirement, so to speak. Um, even for him, he still knew deep down the difference between good and bad. And he still cared about people. Anyway. What else we got? Who else we have? Well, then I kind of went on the, um, uh, you know, like the Game of Thrones kick for a little bit. So I, that's I purposely didn't put any down. Did you not? So I did Tyrion Lannister and then Jon Snow and then Arya Stark and Cersei Lannister. So I kind of like two men, two women. Um, My thought was Samwell or Tyrion. Well, yeah, I know, because you're in love with Samuel. <laughs> I love you Samuel. are Samuel. I love Samuel. But I, I think it was also because I couldn't decide on who my favorite was out of that whole group. Because I liked all of them individually. I've come in. The thing is, I think probably Peter Dinklage is Tyrion is probably, yeah. or Maisie Williams is Arya, probably out, out of those two. Um, because um, Tyrion was such a complicated character. And, yeah. uh, you know, you he felt for him an and you too. hated him. <laughs> and then. Um, you understood actually he was again someone who was striving for the greater good. Understanding and empathy. Yeah. You understood his plight, even though you didn't relate to him. And he had a, and he had a disability to begin with right. in the fact that he was a little person and he had been hated by his father. His own family. Despised yeah. by his, yeah. I think mainly his father. I mean, I feel like <clears throat> his brothers and, his brothers and sister, his brother and sister, got to hate him because of what he did for what he thought was right. Killing, well, and they blamed her for, you know, his, their mother died in childbirth and all this shit. Yeah. yeah. But it even got worse. And then she, he killed his father with a crossbow. Oof, but he deserved so it. Great. Oh, it's damn, it's the worst. Yeah. So I, I guess just, you know, at, we're going to go and go into more of our list, obviously. But on that note, like these little conversations we're talking about, when we're talking about certain favorite characters, when you are developing your own character, you want to be having the same conversation with yourself in terms of who the character is, etc. Not just for backstory reasons, but to help that help you then create moments that will show who this character is. Like the moments that we saw early on with Tyrion, the interactions with his brothers, the interactions with him in, in the fact, world he's around him. He's a drunk him. and has prostitutes. Totally. What are the moments that are going to show? Not tell and through dialogue and all that crap. What are what's going to show the audience who this person is with as few words as possible? Of course, dialogue's involved, but that's where your level of brainstorming should go. Not just random prose writing of backstory, but what are the moments that are going to then show the... Because that's going to turn into scenes. I think the backstory is interesting because you're going like who they are and how they got here. And then try and think about what would they do with that now. information. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, then we have a few people talking about yeah, what they'd like. Comments. So let's let's have a chat. Let's have a look okay. at those. So um, let's see. Elizabeth Mai is a story farm writer. Hello. Let's see. EJ Wyatt. I actually like the last Boy Scouts character more than I like Die Hard. Um, I remember the movie Last Boy Scouts, but uh, was Alan Rickman in Last Boy Scouts? I can't remember. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Lieutenant. Uhuru from Star Trek was a breakthrough yes, character. Yes, she was a breakthrough she character. Was. The first African American yeah. um, and female, and she was on the bridge. You know, how dare she, yeah. being a woman? <laughs> Lord, Lawrence Fishburne in Deep Cover wasn't relatable. However, the character was amazing. I have not seen Deep Cover, so I apologize. I don't know. Um, original Star Wars broke amazing barriers. It really did. Star Trek was, uh, or Star Trek, I'm sorry, uh, was canceled. Uh, and brought back with a vengeance, left the party, but hi. Hey, Kim Elizabeth, new hi, story Kim farm Elizabeth. writers. Good to see you, Kim. Um, let's see, anybody else commenting on, you know, I do kind of want to mention this little comment from EJ where he's saying up, if you scroll up a little bit, let's see, some comedies are solely based off character development, half-baked Seinfeld, always funny. So, always sunny. Always sunny, <laughs> yeah. I was, my brain is, I'm, I'm already through a glass of wine. But, um, <laughs> This is part of the experiment. <laughs> um, what experiment is this? <laughs> how, yeah, how listening to how horribly stupid we sound after a while, uh, just one glass of wine. Um, EJ's right in that a lot of comedies are character driven. Uh, I but the the word there in his comment is solely based off character development, because especially in sitcoms, because what you have with sitcoms is that it's literally a situational comedy. So you have characters like Chandler, Rachel, Ross, Joey, who are always going to be themselves. Yes, they evolve a little bit, but they're not really going to change. So then instead you have those characters put into situations. multiple situations. Yeah. So it isn't necessarily based on character development. It's based on character trait. So I just wanted to make that distinction, but it, mainly because it's a good educational thought process you know, and, and approach for you when and if you're going to try to write a half-hour comedy those characters don't necessarily need to go through an arc like they do in film. They just are who they are, and their uniqueness is then going to draw out the situation you put them in. Yes, and the fact that, and how they interact with each other. I did put Matt LeBlanc down for his uh, work in episodes, okay. though, oh, rather episodes. than okay. um, Friends. And also, my other one down that road is Ricky Gervais um, for his TV show Extras. God, it's so funny. Um, it's so funny. The, you know, like the comedy his, of embarrassment. In his recent show, though, um, uh, about death... death. Dead to me. Oh shoot! Dead to me. Um, really interesting character. It, it was a he, no, but that felt like because I've met Ricky a few times because he's been to my venue in London, the Hennessy Theatre. Yeah, and everything he talks about in the in the most recent one about death is how he feels about life. Right. Um, and it's you know how amazing to get paid for writing and putting your views out into. He's the earned world. it though. It's not like this is his first thing. But extras, I feel like is is a mixture of a character. So a failed actor who is trying to get work as an extra whilst also writing his sitcom yeah. and meeting other people who are trying to find work as an actor and then having famous people in it and putting them in incredibly difficult or embarrassing situations. Awkward situations, yeah. I mean, that was a brilliant premise. Yeah, it uh, really was. That was really well done. <laughs> and then I, for my, I, like, I love Alison Janey from West Wing and then, but I also love her in Mom. She's um, really good in Mom. She's such a, and that is yeah. a sitcom. But she is because she's so funny, and her timing is incredible. Yeah, she plays a horrible, selfish, horrible person, alcoholic. But she's trying, you know. She's, she's trying, really trying. Yeah, but yeah, but she's trying, and and so annoying, but so charming as well. You let her off every time. And you can see then that inherent conflict with that, not just that type of character, but these characters in general, like especially the Alice and Jenny character from Mom. She has never really been a very good person. She's been an alcoholic. She wasn't a good mom. She's a terrible mom. And, but now the situation for the show is she's trying to be better. She's trying to be a mom again. She's trying to not be an alcoholic. <clears throat> All of that generates multiple episodes and situations that you can then put that character into. So yes, it is a brainstorm for character first and then the situations. But it's kind of a little bit of both when you're trying to write a sitcom or half-hour comedy. Yeah. I right. also put um, Kristen Bell in that one for The Good Place. Kristen Bell in good, good Place. Yeah, so really much. good. I didn't put The Good Place down. I was trying to go for my like all-time favorites for TV since we're still on it. Um, I couldn't choose between Frasier or Niles. I think I'm leaning toward Niles. God, it has to be Niles. I think I'm leaning toward, but Frasier is really good. Is his name Lloyd 
Pierce, um, da- uh, David, David Lloyd, Hyde Pierce. Hyde Pierce. David Hyde Pierce. Oh He's my so great. God, his timing is yeah. everything. He's really and he just good. nuanced. He's so nuanced. Yeah. And that's a I good think example. Frasier became a caricature of the character of Frasier. Yeah, probably. Which, he, after how many seasons, it's kind of hard not to. But yeah. that's, those are good examples of really a whole show based on it, but those two characters, entirely unrelatable to most of America and the rest of the world. And that's why you had to have Marty there to keep right. everyone else grounded in the real totally. world. Yeah, yeah. Um, who else did I have? Um, I couldn't decide between George Costanza or Elaine Bennis. I think I like Elaine better because she just isn't as horrible of a person as George. <laughs> in, oh, even Seinfeld, yeah. yeah. Elaine is, just, it's, every time she's on the screen, I'm, you're just glued to it. I just love that character, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Um, you mentioned Walter White. Um, I, I also did um, <coughs> Olivia Coleman in Broadchurch. And she's also oh. going to be the new queen in The Crown. Claire Foy was... Oh, interesting. Was the, uh, I didn't finish The Crown. The Crown was the Queen Elizabeth in The Crown for the first two series. Yeah. And now because they're doing an older... Queen Elizabeth. Oh, they're going further back. It. And they're going older, so she's like she's coming towards. Us. Oh, so it's the same queen, obviously. So it's still queen. queen Elizabeth, yeah. but now Olivia Coleman's going to play oh, the queen. Oh God, she was amazing in um, the favorite. The favorite, holy crap! And she was amazing in Broadchurch, and her character in Broadchurch, which uh, if you haven't seen, there's an American version of it or a British version. I must admit. I saw both of them, and they're literally word for word, but I much preferred David Tennant when he was using his own Scottish accent in the British one with Olivia Colman to work with. Um, David Tennant's great, and all of it. I think his Doctor Who was my favorite Doctor Who. Yeah, amazing. But, I mean, it's just... She has this weird thing about being... And I think she even has it in the favorite, um, of being so lovely... I mean, it was in that speech she when she got the Oscar. In favorite. No, but when she got the Oscar, you know, her loveliness, in, in, in even in the favorite, uh, the vulnerability and the yes, level of vulnerability for sure. And that ability to kind of like, even though she's being a monster, you kind of know where it's coming from, yeah. and it's it, she. But she, the actress, brings that. Right, and it's totally. the same with the Broadchurch yeah. character. I mean, she like, seems she's like totally one of those people upon. that I'd love to hang out with because she just seems like the sweetest person. Yeah. But just, I mean, I, I mean, she's still, don't get me wrong, she's driven and she has oh. worked hard and yeah. she um, right. is really talented, but she's so talented. I know, yes, back to this. So, well, so John Channel has, uh, is bringing up a character I forgot about. I don't know if it's one of my favorite characters, but it is one of my favorite movies. What about Jodie Foster's character in Contact? Uh, she's Gosh. flawed, yet strong-willed, confident, highly intelligent, but as the story progresses, she second-guesses herself on certain issues and struggles to come to terms with herself and her beliefs. She's a very well-rounded and interesting character, and in the end comes full circle and concludes at peace, uh, concludes at peace with herself. So I think I, I agree with everything you're saying, John. The interesting thing about that character is her moment when she says they should have sent a poet, when she's finally off in the the you know special machine that they built, and she looks out into the cosmos and says they should have sent a poet. For me, that was. She, there was always a, a level of vulnerability for Jodie Foster, and she was so kind of anti-religion. Well, it was such a faith a thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, a, a, it was a Matthew McConaughey's yeah. kind of like, are you? Do you believe in God? And right. if you, you know, do you believe in anything? Right. And believing in anything seemed to be the reason as to why you would want yeah. to have the contact with anything or other life force. I think the beauty of that movie was the whole point of Jodie Foster's character going on that journey was to believe that there's something else going on, but primarily in, in terms of some form of higher power, um, but primarily to reconnect with her father and to come to grips with the loss of her dad from a spiritual standpoint as opposed to a just straight scientific one. Um, plus, just the movie looked amazing and it was just great. It's ahead of its time. So great. I mean, there's a reason why it's still really great now, so great. isn't it? Yeah. It's very, very good, James V. Hart. Very, very good. Let's see, George Costanza is basically Larry David, of course. Writer Girl Karma. I like quirky, unique, clever, authentic, goofy, misunderstood characters. Uh, Buffy Summers from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Veronica Mars, Ally McBeal. I loved Ally McBeal. Yeah. Jess Day from New Girl is good. Phoebe, Bu- Phoebe Buffay. Yes. Phoebe's great. Uh, Rachel Bloom. Yeah, she's, she's fun. Uh, and then Zoe Hart from Heart of Dixie. I have not, that's the only one I haven't seen out of them. Uh, Heart of Dixie. But I love your listing, all women. I love that. 
Um, yeah, and I agree the the comment there about um, Californication, and if it hadn't been, uh, what's his name, David Duchovny. Yeah. I mean, I have never fancied him doing the X Files. You know, I was like, he's a short guy. Right. With a bit, you know, he was he was a bit of a dick in the X Files. <laughs> but and he firmly he, believed in something. But but he was even more of a dick oh, yeah, in Californication. Yeah. Yeah. He was arch dick. And, oh my God, he was sexy. <laughs> just like, oh my God, David Duchovny, hello. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd never felt like that before. So I think obviously that was really great writing. Ever? Not for, not for him. <laughs> for him, I know. I know. And I think that's the thing about it too. I once did a play um, by a guy called Glyn Maxwell. And he is this incredible. Glyn? Glyn Maxwell. Oh, Glenn. Okay. Glyn. Oh, it is Glyn. Glyn. Okay. Yeah, with an N though, not an M. Yeah. And uh, he is a, he's a poet. And um, he writes in iambic pentameter, so 12 beats to a line. And he wrote three plays for me with my voice in his head. And the characters he wrote were so amazing. And when I came down mm -hmm. after doing them, or when I kind of met people after off coming off stage, I felt like the dreariest person on the planet. <laughs> because the character he You live within that character. ...was yeah. so amazing that... Mm -hmm. Like, plain old Felicity Wren was a bit like, oh dear, oh dear, love, you need a bit of personality. I mean, the other thing is you are a bit brain dead after you've been live on stage oh for God, like two imagine, hours. Yeah. But, it, that, so I feel like that maybe that's what happened with David Duchovny, I don't know, I've never met him. But he was such a sexy guy in that, I wonder if but people met him and went, oh, you're not, you're not him. I, there has to be that with actors and actresses, just the, like the real people in the real Cheers world. To they meet the person, they're either disappointed or even that much more in awe or something, you know. Like, uh, um, Robert Downey Jr., I think, is pretty, he was pretty much playing himself in Iron Man. <laughs> yeah. He's pretty much just himself. Um, what else? Buffalo, he's a, he's a hero of mine. John Gigrich says, uh, Early Grace, California, Re, Winter's Bone, Elizabeth Sa Salander, uh, Rue of HBO, Euphoria, Omar uh, Little, the Omar Little, for sure, and Rue from Euphoria. I haven't heard the other three. <laughs> I know the movie Winter's Bone. Oh, I assume that's uh, Jessica Lawrence's character. But nice reference there, John. Uh, let's see. Mary Davis says, It's interesting in making my documentary that I guide the men being interviewed to reveal themselves in the way they tell about their mothers, the hidden, hidden starts of my film. So, oh, that's interesting. To try to hit the feminine side of who the character is. Well, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? I mean... Um... It's the person who birthed you, so the relationship you have to them would have a lot to do with how you live the rest of your mm -hmm. life. For and sure. someone that's known, I've been in relationships with people that have loved their mothers, and I've also been in maybe one, one maybe two relationships with men that didn't, and boy. Huge difference. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. even like how they treat themselves, how they treat women in general, and how they thought about women in general, and actually how they treated me. So, uh, it it's is a good it idea, is, Mary. It is very revealing um, about how you. I mean, and I guess for the same for the fathers, you know, and how what the women feel about their fathers. You know, these these mainstays in the beginning of your life in your formative years make a big difference. Yeah. Um, so that's. Oh, I'm not going to do. I'm not going to be political about cages. Okay, that's totally <laughs> well, fine. Well, Michael Berkeley has a nice uh, list here. Uh, Paul Giamatti and Thomas Hayden Church in Sideways. Their strong character differences and interplay, frust interplay, frustration with each other's flaws are great. I think that's what's so great about that movie is that Paul Giamatti knows how crappy of a person Thomas Hayden Church's <laughs> character yeah. is. I hate him. And yet they're still friends. And then by the end of it, Paul just gets so frustrated by Hayden Church's character. But Hayden Church gets his comeuppance a little bit, even though he still goes home and marries his wife. He's a horrible person. But it still forced Paul Giamatti, who was the main character, to change his life. Yeah, it kind of kicked him up the bum, didn't it? Yeah. And yeah. he did still meet someone lovely, which is kind of nice. So let's move to movies then. All right, movies. Um, so I did put the favorite in there too, to nod to Olivia Coleman, Emma Stone, Rachel Weisz, because I just thought the three of them were just such a great team together. They were together. pretty great characters. Um, and they're kind of the way they played off each other and the... Um, 
I mean, it was built so beautifully and the sets were so amazing and the kind of the setup was wonderful. And then Francis McDermott, I think we always come back to Three Billboards out of Ebony, yeah. Missouri, because like you were saying about that moment to show something about an internal character when she's yeah. berating the guy but flicks the beetle up. We've it's talked a, about it's this before. It's such a great moment. We've talked about it before. Since we have some new people on here, we'll just say it again. But in the moment in Three Billboards, she's yelling at the sign guy. Uh, the who, billboard guy. The who's, billboard who, guy. Who basically... Um, he was, I can't remember the reason she was mad, but she was really upset. Like the police were forcing him to take him down or something. I can't remember. But she was screaming at him, being really a horrible person. And this poor guy was like, whoa. And then she stops yelling and she sees a beetle on the windowsill. And the beetle's upside down and his legs are kind of flailing and it can't turn itself over. And, he, and she goes over uh, to the beetle and stares at it and then flips it over, helps it get back onto its feet. Just so gently. Well, shouting her head off at this young kid, because yeah, yeah. Um, basically, yeah, it was about the fact that I think she, I think they were going to take them down, and because she didn't have enough money to buy any more, and then she gets a generous benefactor who right. pays for it. Yeah. But so she's in there kind of berating him, but she's like literally shouting, shouting, shouting. Right. Oh, there's a beetle that flips yeah. it, and it's just such a nice moment. It's such it a says, great moment. Yeah. And also because she's literally fighting to try and find her daughter's killer, mm-hmm. and. Um, there's something interesting about that and the fact that she's a, seen as perceived as a monster when all she's right. looking for is justice for some her daughter being murdered. Yeah. And yet still, because she's not pretty, she wears a boiler suit, she runs a farm. You know, she has, she's not feminine in her wild. And she isn't acting, you know, she's acting like the men. Yeah. yeah. And so the, there's a lot of pushback against her not being womanly. Yeah. Um, whereas actually what she's doing is a, a true kind of pride There's mother a, lion you, moment. You actually have a moment where you can relate to a character where a second before you couldn't relate to her. Yeah. And suddenly you see a relatable moment, but more importantly you see who she actually and really is. She's not a monster. You could have she's had so her hurt. smush the beetle. And it says a completely different thing about who that she's character is. She's so upset. Yeah. And she's just trying to get justice. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, let's see. Some of my other... I mentioned Indiana Jones, The Bride from Kill Bill. George Bailey, of course. Of course. It's a Wonderful Life. I just love George. Uh, I, I would... I, I w- hesitated to give some Lord of the Rings references just because I'm such a huge fan and not everybody loves those movies, but I grew up in the books, loved the movies intensely. Uh, Aragorn and Samwise are probably my, my two favorite bo- uh, characters there. But more specifically on some nuanced level. Like, you know, aside from the obvious ones... We both share Inigo Montoya. And Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride, yeah. which also brings me back to Robin Wright, who from Princess Bride and House of Cards. Right. Really love her. Okay. Um, then I have my um, for, uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me, which is Richard E. Grant's character in that. He oh, was he was so a good character. Good. Yeah. And he was also brilliant in With Nell and I. Richard E. Grant We're has about been. talking characters, not actors. Yeah, not actors. Uh, I, love, I that. love that character in that. <laughs> the character was great. And also the character in With Nell is very good yeah. in that one. And he also played a, in Girls, he played um, oh. a, a real kind of um, a nasty piece of work to one of the characters He's in Girls. He's a hell of an actor. Hell of Such a good actor. Yeah. Uh, then I also had Emma Thompson, who... <laughs> Which um, character? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, she, I like her in Nanny McPhee. Nanny McPhee's a great character. Um, and also, she, the one that she wrote, the um, kind of the one that was her big breakout that she wrote and oh, she directed it. But she was also in it. It's the kind of like yes. it's the Emily Bronte, is it? No, no. Uh, uh, oh shit! It's based on the Jane Austen. Jane Austen. Yeah. That's it. Sorry, Jane Austen. Yeah. You know who I mean. Yeah, <laughs> we know I who don't we mean. remember what it was. Um, but, you know, she, her character in that is to kind of very mm-hmm. put herself on the back burner, you know, don't uh, um, shout about who you are. Um, Nanny McPhee, I think, is just a brilliant character in the fact that she... But she's, she's kind of a, a device. It's a total device, but it's a fun character because you're presenting this person who looks so horrible, so you assume she's so horrible. And then as the story goes along, you realize and learn by her actions that she's actually a really good person and she's helping these kids. And so it's just, that's, a, it's an, that's an easy little way to brainstorm uh, for a character. How do I want to be presenting this person visually so the audience thinks one thing, but then we see Frances McDormand flip the little beetle over. We um, see her walk disappear <clears throat> in Nanny McPhee, right. her tooth yeah. go back into her head. Yeah. And that beauty is really in the eye of the beholder and the actions that you take. Um, Amelie was on mine as well, uh, the character of Amelie. Um, oh, Amelie, yeah, right. Because... Um, Again, very sweet, very trying to do the right thing, mysterious, curious, mischievous, 
um, uh, a bit lost. Uh, I kind of like those kind of characters. And then she, but again, she's outward serving. You know, she's trying to help. She's trying again, to turn totally. the book. You see, you see and understand the motivation. Yeah. Um, then I've got my Forrest Gump and Ron Burgundy. And <laughs> I have Ron Burgundy too. And then I have Meryl Streep, of course, but for the Devil Wears Prada. She, everything she everything does. The, that Devil, Devil Wears Prada character, it was phenomenal. She yeah. was so good. Yeah. And I also, because I remember when they did, um, they talked to her about it, they interviewed her, and she said, she, you know, based on Anna Winter from Vogue, and she didn't want her to be a monster. She wanted her to have been a woman that has been in a man's world, so has had to behave in a very masculine way, but has still managed to get where she is, and she's cruel and she's you know to the point but she in there she's in there oh, yeah there's a there's there's a little that i can all of us there is a little person that is vulnerable kind yeah, sweet, right, all the right. kind of stuff whatever kind of barriers and you put. finally see it at the end of the movie yeah. yeah yeah um writer girl karma i am re-watching house great character and i find it fascinating because he's so unlikable and horrible to the people around him and we're constantly taught that our protagonist must be likable or at least relatable, though he isn't really either, yet there is something that keeps it intriguing. After all, it lasted eight seasons. What's intriguing is that House is so good at what he does. That's it. He's so good at it. He's, it's like a Sherlock Holmes. He's basically Sherlock Holmes in a hospital situation. Oh, I like that. And, and, but then is. what helps with Virgin, House clever. is that even though the insults he gives his co-workers are insults, his co-workers are growing because of the insults a little bit. And they're growing and Backhand evolving. Backhand compliments and yeah, stuff, isn't they it? they are. It's a very British thing. To, oh, you're playing American shit. It's a very British thing yeah. anyway to give you a backhanded compliment. Yeah, yeah. So again, there, the relatability is his inability to be liked by other people in spite of being really good at something. And I think we can all kind of have that experience every now and also he's a complete failure in relationships isn't he right. he can't let anyone in there's he a level has, of empathy he has a disability um you know he's hooked on painkillers he's there's plenty of things wrong with him um yeah but he <laughs> he's also doing good you know he is trying oh to yeah cure. He, he cares about the patients so there is that level of yeah, and he least... doesn't care about bureaucracy which again I, you know i love that i love the anti-authority um, right. you know anti-authority right. element to it um yeah all right so who else do i have my on my list of george bailey Indiana jones uh dorothy gale i had to put dorothy from wizard of oz mm -hmm. i love dorothy uh martin blank from gross point blank it's john cusack have you ever seen gross point blank i think i have but he's I don't an remember. assassin who was forced to go home to his hometown for his 10-year high school reunion. And he meets up with the girl that he was supposed to go to prom with in high school, but like left her at the doorstep or whatever. <clears throat> and of course he has to take out somebody in his hometown. Really fun movie. But that type of character who is, again, he has a talent and he's really good at what he does, but he's so flawed and he has so many problems inside of him and he's like regretting everything he's ever done and he's trying so hard to not do... So he doesn't want to be his, an assassin anymore? He doesn't anymore. want to be an assassin anymore, and he feels so bad about the girl that he left at the doorstep, and yet he has to stay cold. He has to stay assassin because he has this last you know, job. job to do. So it's just I a don't know really if they ever stop job. being an assassin. It seems to me assassin right. is a job for life. Yeah. The people that hire you are never going to stop calling you. Right. And they've got all that shit on you afterwards, haven't they? Yeah. So, of course, I have Sunshine, the term of Sunshine, so Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey's character in Sunshine. Okay. Um, and then I also have, um, I always have my hours, three, which is um, Julianne Moore and... Excuse me, Meryl Streep again, and Nicole Kidman. So the characters from The Hours. Yeah, the characters from The Hours. Who so play women in Virginia different colors. Virginia Woolf. Yeah, Virginia Woolf, yeah. and then... And then the housewife. The housewife that feels like Mrs. Dalloway, and then... Um, uh, I don't remember Meryl Streep's character. Uh, Meryl Streep is the... Is basically... She's the best friend of Julianne Moore's son. I don't remember. Yeah, so Julianne Moore's son... Um, is devastated by the fact that his mom left, and Jude, and he's gay, and oh, okay. Meryl Streep's character right, has right, been right, madly right. in love with him, even though she has a girlfriend who is Alison Janney. So of oh, course, okay. yeah, hell of a cast. So The Hours is a very well acted movie oh, to say the least. So good. 
Um, let's see. Ace Ventura. Love Ace Ventura. He's a ridiculous character. But just fun to watch. Peter Venkman is probably one of my all-time favorite movie characters. That's Bill Murray in Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. Just love that character. He's such a prick. And he's a total womanizer. But then suddenly he has the ghost experience. You can kind of see him change a little bit. Like, I watched it recently, I think, when I was at home in Wisconsin. And I, I paid attention to him. And he starts off, he's pre presented as just this really cocky guy, the typical Bill Murray character. And he has the ghost moment where he's slimed. He, you can see the change, which is interesting because at first glance, you're like, oh, Peter Venkman is just Peter Venkman. But he does evolve. And then when he has the moment with uh, Sigourney Weaver's character, when Sigourney, Weaver char uh, Sigourney Weaver's character is possessed and floating above the bed, do you remember? Um, Bill Murray comes over to her apartment and asks, are you the gatekeeper? Right. And, and he's like, doesn't let him in. And she, he eventually goes in, and she, being possessed, wants to have sex with him. And he's like, I could. No, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Mm. And, and, and so he, he's actually then very nice to this woman who's totally possessed and leaves her. And it was the technically opposite of how he was treating the women at the beginning of the movie. So it, it was just an interesting little. Oh, what a nice turnaround for that character. There was a turn. <laughs> yeah, right. He's, re he's redeemed, I guess. <laughs> But he's still, oh, come on, he's funny. He said no to sex. The last few, Ferris Bueller, I love. Shrek, Doc Brown from uh, Back to the Future, Ron Burgundy. Love Beetlejuice. Michael Keaton is Beetlejuice, one of my all-time favorite movie characters. What do you like about him? Oh, my God. He's, he's so over-the-top and ridiculous. There's no redemption for him. He's, the, he's a perfect villain in that he knows he's horrible. He's owned it. Like, he's, he's owned his own horribleness. Yeah, as a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but a dead person. He also we also know quite early on what he wants, and he doesn't. He wants to get out of this situation he's in. He wants to be alive again, right? Even though they don't make a huge deal out of that, um, but he's also just really funny. And most of that was improvised, by the way. Oh, Michael Keaton's yeah, amazing. Michael Keaton's amazing. And I had to throw the crossover of Kermit the Frog. Okay, my last <laughs> one. My last one then is the Matrix. Neo. Oh, the Neo. Matrix. And I think. It's an interesting thing. It's weird how I'm kind of drawn to actors as well as the roles. Um, yeah. Because they always say about Kristen Stewart is that she is kind of like a blank slate. So whatever she does, she did this thing called, oh God, The Shop. Uh, she did a movie where it was kind of like a small kind of underground one where she was basically, she was, um, she was like a stylist. Oh God. Anyway, um, she was know. really good. It was very good. And she was really good in that. And um, and I feel the same is kind of, I mean, like, he's having, Keanu Reeves is having such a beautiful renaissance. And thank, you know. He's really coming good out. good for him. You know, yeah. You know, um, he is, he gives away so much of his money that he got for the Matrix of Charity. He's like a super dude. Right. You know, gets on the tube, gets on the metro, you know, yeah. the conversion. Um hasn't been spoilt, you know, by money whatsoever. But I think about the Matrix is that him being the one, Neo, him being the one, he he has a he never plays it, you know, he never never plays up. It kind of it's it's so He was a little too neutral for me. Yeah, but that's the whole thing, isn't it? So you can project yourself on it. That's the whole thing. So you can be the one. So you okay. can see who you are. All right, I can see that, I guess. So Keanu Reeves was the perfect actor for that role. <laughs> yeah. But, and it's it's a really great character to look at because we can relate to that character a lot more than we you think on the surface because we all think we're leaving, living this mundane life. And then to have that sudden discovery of, wait, I'm a superhero. Like, that's pretty, that's fun. Superhero that's in your exciting. own life. I don't yeah. believe that is true. You are a superhero yeah. in your own life. Um, to finish this off, we're already going up over an hour. We don't usually do that, so this was a fun episode. But Writer Girl Karma says, Elle Woods from Legally Blonde. I love Elle Woods. Uh, Red in Shawshank Redemption. Of course, I love Red, Morgan Freeman's character. Agreed. Uh, Rudy Rudiger from Rudy, one of my, my favorite films, too. Although, in real life, Rudy was incredibly annoying. <laughs> he wouldn't say no to, to anybody. Um, let's he see. wasn't a good father to his kids. Michael Berkeley says it's a reflection that we live in a meritocracy. Also, Dexter, Dexter and Lucifer. Dexter's a great character. Yeah, really great, incredibly flawed. Um, all right. Well, anyway, I think uh, you know. You think you get you get our drift here. I, when you're developing your own characters, just make sure to 
give them a light and a dark side. That's why I hesitate to use the word flaw sometimes because when I say, the, what's the character's flaw? Or the character has to have a flaw. It doesn't mean necessarily that a flaw is a bad thing. It's just a you trait. Can be, you can be too tidy. Right. You can be overly ambitious. Ambitious is a good thing, but if you're doing it in a way that is affecting other people negatively, it's, it's, it's a sweet and a sour. You want to be looking at who these people are. Like Ace Ventura is a funny little example. He's extremely good at what he does, and he's totally devoted to animals, and he loves animals more than he loves humans, and all these things. And yet, what's happening is that it's it's not allowing him to take care of the rest of his life. Like he can't afford to eat. He needs to save this bird, or else he won't be able to pay rent. All this stuff. So there's this level of ambition that is actually affecting his life negatively. So you want to be looking at that sweet and sour uh, level of your character. Is that the cat? It's our next door neighbor with the oh, gate. Oh, the gate. Sorry, <laughs> since we had the um, earthquakes, we had two we earthquakes. We had some earthquakes. But I actually wasn't here. I was here by myself. And yeah. any kind of weird noise or wobble or anything like that, Last night I we were on the couch get... and I'm just sitting there watching. She's like, okay, okay. I'm like, I, I don't know what happened. I honestly had the panic. <laughs> and I think happened. it's just because uh, it was one of the scariest things I have. It's the scariest yeah. thing I get so it. far. You, I it, and it, can it, you have like that memory of it so, too. Yeah, it's like literally the fear just comes yeah. straight. It's, it's so deep. Yeah. It's one of those things I realized that I really wanted to be alive because when it happened, I'm like, fuck. There you go. Oh. Easy with it the was, language. It we was are drinking deep. wine. Anyway, I think it's, uh, it's a good way to end it on an F-bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. Thank you, everyone, for tuning That's in. As intense. always, we had a nice audience today. We love the comments as always. Um, anybody, you really do make it much more fun when you join in. Honestly, it is. It's so it is much fun. More fun. Thank we, you. We um, are not going to be on again until you are back from Paris. Yeah, from Edinburgh. So by I then, believe be... it's the end of August. We're, this was like our little kind of midway through our summer break. Don't forget about us, kind of broadcast. I believe we'll be back at the end of August. She's back. I think what you're back. I the think 13th? I'm back on the I'm back on the thirteenth. So I'll see you on the fourteenth. I believe it's August fourteenth is our next broadcast. But you'll pay attention to our ISA Facebook page, Twitter, and um, lovely Samantha. I think is Instagram. gonna is gonna post some of our past Wine Wednesdays in the weeks in between. If you yeah. want, if you miss us, or you can find us on. If you're an ISA Connect member, you can find us on the site. Or you can go to YouTube and watch them from there. You can, but you can also go to our Facebook page and click on the videos on the left-hand side of the page, and you can see all the past wine Yeah, before. I mean, they always have a title, so if there's something that really piques your yeah. interest, please go ahead. Also, do sign up for um, John Truby's free web Free webinar, webinar, for sure, 31st. And if you're looking for help, obviously John Truby is the way to go. I have availability on my roster if you want to work with me. Uh, Max at thestoryfarm.org. But, um, yeah. but yeah, go sign up. Go sign up. I, and the people did the thirty day challenge. How did that go? It went really well. A lot of people signed up a little late, um, and so they were asking for extensions. I'm like, that's not really the point. <laughs> um, but they really enjoyed it, and you know, I, I have a couple of people reaching out saying, what can I do about working, you know, for the long term? It's important to work with somebody, either a writers group if you can't afford a consultant, or hire a consultant. It really it makes all the difference if you have weekly Just being calls, deadlines, totally accountable. Yeah. But anyway, we'll be back August uh, 14. Uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. If you're on the other side of the world, stay warm and enjoy the winter. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Hi.